Good afternoon. I would like to start by apologizing for the technical problems last time, and most particularly for disappearing at the uh, time uh, for comments and questions after the talk. Uh, I somehow managed to disconnect myself. Uh, this won't happen today because Professor Oliveira has very kindly agreed to monitor the PowerPoints. So to get started with my outline. <clears throat> Next, please. Uh, I'm going to talk today about ditransitives. These are a prototypical example of construction grammar as c conceptualized by uh, Adele Goldberg uh, in 1995 and again in 2006. And she's continued to be very interested in them as the title of her 2019 book, Explain Me This, shows. Her interest in Explain Me This is why that does not sound idiomatic modern English, but it's very easily used. It was used by her son when he was small, and it was used, is used extensively by second language speakers. In the course of the talk, I'm going to discuss alternation. I know there was a question about that maybe three weeks ago. How does construction grammar deal with alternation? I will talk a little bit about that today. Uh, one way in which it deals with it is what are called horizontal links, and I will explain them. The proposal that I'm working with is that there is dative alternation. So there is an alternation a variation between, for example, uh, Bill gave Jane a book and Bill gave a book to Jane. There have been arguments against that and there have been arguments for it. And I think the historical data shows that dative alternation is a robust idea. So I'm going to briefly discuss the history of the ditransitive dative alternation. And I'm going to compare it with the history of the benefactive construction uh, so we can have in modern English, Bill built Jane a house and Bill built a house for Jane. Very interestingly, historically, they behave rather differently. And uh, I think they provide a good example of the way in which historical constructional grammarians need to think about analogy, assimilation, and also dissimilation and dissimilarity. So that's an outline of where we're going today. Uh, as I said, Roger Goldberg is devoted to accounting for ditransitives. For examples, Joe gave Mary a sweater with a hole in it, uh, which he analyzes as X, Joe, caused Y, Mary, to receive Z, a sweater with a hole in it. And at that time in 1995, she also said that Sally baked her sister a cake is a good example of a diatransitive, which is X intend Y to receive Z. Uh, I'll talk about the fact that she doesn't agree with that position anymore. She doesn't treat uh, benefactors as diatransitives anymore, or not in anything that I've read by her. Uh, in 1C, we get Frank sneezed the napkin off the table. X cause Y to move Z. In the 1995 book, she argues that Frank sneezed the, at the napkin off the table is quite closely related to Joe gave Mary a sweater with a hole in it. This is a bit of a surprise when you think about it because 
off the table is a prepositional phrase and doesn't seem to have much to do with Joe gave Mary a sweater with a hole in it. The same is true, Sam gave a piece of land to his son, X cause Y to move to Z. This is called a transfer caused motion to a goal. And I'm going to be talking about that quite a bit. And uh, one E, she painted the chair a dark shade of red. X cause Y becomes Z, that's a resultative. So what Goldberg has been interested in is that each of those sentence types has three arguments in it. A subject, an object who receives something, and a thing received. So an agent who is a subject, a recipient who is the second, uh, uh, the first object and a second object, which is a thing. Now, Goldberg has considered those uh, five different sentence types to be independent but related. Others, however, <clears throat> for example, Volk, Rosenbach, Bresman, and Smrik uh, in 2013, provided evidence that recipient ditransitives are in alternation with two PP, two prepositional phrase constructions, like he gave her a book and he gave a book to her which has caused motion <clears throat> in Goldberg's work. Unfortunately, <clears throat> I've not been able to get a picture of Volk on the Rosenbach. However, uh, there's Joan Bresnan and Benedict Smixanier. You are probably very familiar with this. He gave her a book, subject, verb, object one, object two is called DOC or ditransitive object construction. It's also called the ditransitive construction. So it's either dark or ditransitive, and I'll probably use both those uh, terms today. He gave the book to her is subject verb object two to object one, and is called the POC or prepositional object construction, and also the dative construction. And again, I will be using both those terms today. Now the proposed prototypical dative alternation in present day English is as in two. Her father gave her birthday presents in 2013 to New Jersey counties alone incarcerated or gave ankle monitors to 1800 parents. Now this for convention so that we can keep track of these different objects. Uh, object one, the recipient, normally a human being, but not always, uh, is in bold. So her into A and to 1800 parents into B. And the theme, usually non-animate, is underlined, so birthday presents in 2A and ankle monitors in 2B. In this construction, the recipient is understood to receive the theme, object two. It is a direct recipient. Uh, that's a term uh, that Kay used in 2005, and I will refer to direct recipient constructions. And likewise, there's a proposed prototypical benefactive alternation in 3A. Kaneko took several years off from ceramics to build himself a house, where himself is the recipient and the house is the object too. 
And in 3B, Jose had always rejected suggestions by friends to build a house for himself. Now here the recipient is understood to be intended to receive object two. It's not necessarily the case that even though Kaneko took several years off to build himself a house, he ever did build it while he was alive. And we'll find an example, a historical example, uh, which shows this very clearly. So this is intention. If I bake you a cake, I intend you to receive it. Uh, you might not. It has nothing to do whether you like it or not, eat it or not. It's just that I intend it for you. But that does not implicate that you actually received it. Now, in what follows, I'm going to show how using network links, especially the idea of horizontal as well as vertical links uh, to account for alternations, is helpful in thinking about the history of dative and benefactive alternations. And uh, this, what I'm going to talk about, uh, it draws extensively from Eva Sehentner's work, uh, several articles in a book, and a paper that I wrote with her in uh, 2020. So now moving on to the nature of links and how we talk about alternation. Uh, you may recall that the networks that are typically talked about in construction grammar are ta taxonomic hierarchies that represent levels of abstractness using vertical tree structures. They look very much like the generative tree structures. However, as I mentioned before, Basically, you start with the construct at the bottom and build abstractions above them. But these vertical tree structures don't account for variation. And they have been expanded by various people in various ways by what is metaphorically called horizontal relationships. And these particularly concern polysemy. So they have more to do with meaning than with form. This is, this is very important for understanding the way in which alternations have been conceptualized and the way I'll be talking about them. So on the left here is Capel. Uh, and I'll talk more about what he had to say. Uh, in the middle of Van der Velde, and I'll talk more about what he has to say and Perek on the right. Now, Capel suggests that just as in morphology, there are allomorphs, where there are allomorphs such as so there is, so there are allostructions. Now, I'm sure you're all familiar with the so there is alternations. So if I uh, have a noun and I'm doing plurals and nouns, it's cats, dogs, and houses. S, z, us. If I have a third person singular present tense, it's uh, tests, digs, and fishes. S, z, us. So those are allomorphs in morphology. Same way he suggests, Capel suggests, there are allostructions or variants and alternations of constructions under certain conditions. Allomorphs are under certain conditions, phonological conditions. Uh, allostructions are primarily uh, syntactic. Uh, syntactically constrained. So pick the book up and pick up the book or in alternation. And Van der, Va Van der Velde has a much more complex uh, suggestion about how to deal with variants that are polysemous. 
And uh, he is the one who's used the term horizontal links uh, within a hierarchy at the same level of abstraction. Now he borrows the term degeneracy from biology, which was quite a surprise to me because I think of de degeneracy <laughs> in ordinary English as something that has to do with falling apart and it's a very negative word. But degeneracy in biology and in Randevelde's work means for the same phenomenon, structurally different elements can fulfill the same function. An idea that he got from Edelman and Galli in uh, 2001. Edelman and Galli argue that it's accompanied by increasing complexity, understood as increase of integration of parts. Uh, so from that perspective, uh, degeneracy is exactly the opposite of what we think of in <laughs> uh, everyday terminology. I'm going to come back to this example uh, in the last lecture next week. <laughs> um, interesting example of uh, se semantic change. So in a, a syntactic example that van der Velde gives of horizontal links is the position of the finite verb in Dutch. Uh, this is quite typical of Germanic languages. It's not only Dutch, but basically occurs in German uh, and it occurred in Old English. It is not part of modern English at all. But uh, there are three uh, different alternating positions of the finite verb in Dutch and in these other languages. In polarity questions, conditionals and imperatives is usually in the first position. In main clause declaratives, it's usually in second position. And in subordinate clauses, it's usually in final position. These variants are predictable. They are not 100% predictable because various kinds of rhetorical devices can be used to override them. But they are predictable and they can be displayed in a combined vertical and horizontal mo model, which is on the next slide. Next, please. Thank you. All right, so at the top here, we have finite verb. That is a uh, schema or a sub schema, it's an abstraction over three variants. So you'll see that this is a horizontal uh, set of links in terms of arrows that horizontally go left, right, but it is also a vertical set of links because there's a straight up and down between verb finite and its variants. So there's this combined horizontal and vertical. I don't think there are any purely horizontal link models. They always combine, they enrich the vertical. Uh, model. So an example from Dutch, come morgen maar, come tomorrow particle, which means something like you can come tomorrow. Come comes first. He come morgen, he comes tomorrow, or he's coming tomorrow uh, in present day English. And verb Final is that he morgen niet komt, that he tomorrow not come. And we would say that he doesn't come tomorrow. So uh, that's an example of how you can think about uh, variation uh, looking at syntactic, morphosyntactic phenomena uh, from a construction grammar point of view. It can all, that kind of a model can also be used to account for dative and benefactive alternation. Alternation is about variation. 
it presupposes one construction with two or more forms. Well, we had three in the last example. Uh, we will be talking about alternations of two forms today with the ditransitive and the dative alternation and benefactive alternation. Uh, as I mentioned at the very beginning, that there are dative and benefactive alternations is a hypothesis that has been debated. But I do think that it's now relatively widely accepted, at least for dative alternation. And I'm going to argue that the histories provide evidence for alternation. Let's start with arguments against dative alternation. In Goldberg's view, the Dock and Park are two separate constructions, not one construction, it's a recipient construction with variance. In 1995, she argued, and, and also elsewhere, she argued that the prepositional date of construction, the Park, is best analyzed as a separate transitive cost motion construction with an adjunct, not as an alternation paired with a direct recipient ditransitive. So basically to give a book to Jane is in her view, a transfer to a goal. And the goal is an adjunct. In a paper that she, came, she published in 2002, she said observed alternations and paraphrase relations are less important than surface generalizations about argument structured constructions. And what are these surface structured generalizations? They are that basically ditransitives have three arguments and they have three arguments in a row. The other constructions have three arguments. They're not in a row. They have prepositional uh, structures. And so the surface generalization, generalization has to do with the three NPs. In particular, they argue that although the benefactive bake someone a cake looks ditransitive, it's not. Because among other things, the recipient is optional. So it's a, a phrasal adjunct and not an argument. And passive of recipient is not allowed with benefactives, but is with the direct recipient constructions. So, Jim was baked a cake on his birthday is no good in modern English. I don't find it that bad, but I can't find any in the data. And Jim was given a cake on his birthday is perfectly fine. So according to Kay and Nisbet, both bake him a cake and bake a cake for him are transitive plus adjunct constructions. But others like Bresnan and Ford show that data of alternation is predictable. If you ask a semantic pragmatic question, you look at the data and the data was uh, essentially modern English conversational data. Park is preferred with recipient. That is a noun phrase and is a focus of the class. So give a donation to the church. But doc is preferred with a recipient that is a pronoun and is given. Give them a donation. So they suggest that there is a good constraint that 
motivates the alternation, but it is essentially a pragmatic one. It has to do with given new information, focus versus given. Now that's the kind of uh, hypothesis that is testable because it's about modern English. So Perak in 2012 uh, published a paper about a e sorting experiment he did to find out whether speakers combine <clears throat> Park with a cause motion construction or whether they combine it with the dot construction. So he found that they generalized over the dock and the park, not over dock and cause motion. And that supports the hypothesis that these two form a pair in speakers' linguistic knowledge. Uh, this is something that uh, reminds us perhaps of the so-called cognitive commitment that Hoffman was concerned with. And Hoffman said, if you have a construction grammar, you ought to be able to test it. It's a nice test. Uh, Goldberg and uh, Kay and Nisbet's hypothesis under this test did not stand up, but uh, stood up. Uh, the other hypothesis, the alternation hypothesis has stood up quite well. So to, how, how do we account for the abstract dative alternation? How do we visualize it? And Perek proposed that Doc and Park form an abstract construct -eam. This is again taking some uh, vocabulary from uh, morphological studies. You may recall the allos structures. Well, here we have a constructing uh, class of variants under specified for order, generalizing over two specified variants. The two variant is linked to the cause motion construction at some distance. Uh, so he's not rejecting the notion of a link to cause motion. He's just saying it's not very close. It's not as close as the connection between the dock and the park. So looking at figure two, the top line we have direct recipient ditransitive construct in. the form of which has a verb and a question mark for the theme NP and a question mark for the direct recipient NP or PP. And the question mark under specifies the order. And so at this very abstract level, level of a uh, generalization over the dock and the park. Uh, the order of those two, object one and object two, doesn't matter. It's not specified. But at a lower level, uh, sorry, thank you. I'll go back there. At a lower level, the dock is specified with the order, verb, direct, Recipient, NP, theme, NP, horizontally connected to the Tupac, which is verb, theme, NP, direct recipient, PP. So that gives you, again, uh, a vertical and a horizontal link specification that is much richer than a purely vertical model would be. Now, uh, what about the benefactive? 
in historical work, uh, Coleman on the left there and de Klerk on the right, and Sehentner and others have included benefactors within the ditransitive schema. And they consider both the dative and the benefactor of alternation to be valid abstractions. There are, of course, differences between the dative and the benefactor, but they're similar with respect to alternation. They're similar because each pair involves transfer and reception. Benefit entails that object one is intended to receive something. And the pair of alternations are functionally similar to each other, although different in details of historical development, which I will get to, and token frequency and links to other constructions. So, in this pair, each pair has a form and a meaning. The form differs, that is the variation, but the semantic stays relatively constant. Uh, and that is the polysemy uh, within the pair. Now, I'll be talking basically about uh, ditransitives and alternation in general. I'm going to move now uh, to a historical perspective. When you think about modern English and you think about the ditransitive, you probably think first about give and lend. It is thought to be the prototype ditransitive, not only by Goldberg in 1995, but Markutov and many others uh, in 2010. But when you look historically, you see that somewhat different picture. Investigating Gothic, Old English, and Norse Icelandic, Vasquez, Gonzalez, and Brachdahl argue that giving and distributing were central, but not nearly as central uh, to the ditransitive construction as they are in modern English. There were significantly more verbs that could be used in three argument doc structure types than in PDE when you look at early Germanic. So we're talking about roughly uh, 600 or so AD. Uh, all of these languages, Gothic, Old English, and Norse Icelandic had inflectional case. And typically the ditransitive was Subject nom with a nominative case, object one, the recipient with a dative case, and object two, the theme with accusative case. Uh, I'm not going to give examples of the uh, direct recipient construction, the give construction, because they're not very different from modern English. But there were two other types of ditransitive event types in uh, early Germanic, uh, which I will uh, discuss because they're really quite different from what they are in modern English. There's a whole set of verbs of miscreation. So the creation ones are do, do good, make, work, build, to carpenter, to sew, to get, to prepare, make ready, and roll a wheel. The miscreation and semantically negative ones include do ill, do someone ill, do harm, hurt, hurt, cut, kill, contrive, plot, block, a passage, and so forth. And the set includes benefactors, as in five. He siwadun, he fig leaf. This is uh, from Genesis in the Bible. They sowed themselves fig leaves. So they is in the nominative, he is nominative. Sowed he themselves in the dative uh, fig leaves in the acoustic.
So there's that one set of creation and miscreation. Uh, and you will have recognized already, I'm sure, that some of those are not good transitives in modern English. Another big set, many of which no longer occur in modern English, are verbs of possession, obtaining, and disposition. So have, own, appropriate, hoard, amass, spare, take, receive, lay hold of, get, buy, obtain, gather, find, earn, and choose all have to do with possession and obtaining. And then there's another set of disposition, the negative ones, deprive, take away, remove, withdraw, steal, cut off, put off. And this includes malefactors, which I'm going to uh, cite again shortly. Uh, these are examples like cut him the head off. There's a, an example from Old English in six. Before he snatched me, me is dative, my firstborn accusative. We do, don't do that in modern English anymore. Uh, so I'm beginning here to talk about the fact that over the last 1500 years or more, we have been losing members of the ditransitive schema. Now, let's think about give. I, I said this does exist as a ditransitive in uh, earlier Germanic. In Old English, it's usually in doc. Yep, the son of his eldest the daughter, and a good man to weep with richte wedlake. So, gave then immediately his eldest daughter. That is the theme. It's very animate, clearly. That is the theme, and it is accused to. Anum godum men, a good to a good man. And we've got lots of inflections here. Anum, the U-M is a dative. Godum is a dative. Men is dative. All inflectionally dative. To we fit as a wife with proper dowry. That is the normal way which you give in Old English. And it doesn't matter whether you have a full noun phrase or you have a pronoun. This clearly has a full noun phrase, phrase uh, in a recipient doc construction. The word order is different from modern English, but that doesn't matter for this purpose. What we're looking at is that this is a doc construction. There are a very large number of verbs of speaking that are attested with a to NP. So to NP as an adjunct phrase uh, in Old English. So eight, spoke to Israel, Barnum and Quach to him, spoke to Israel's children, said to them. So we've got two verbs of speaking, spoke to Israel's children and said to him, something I haven't included what was said. Uh, which is obviously the uh, theme. But there are a few locutionary verbs that are attested with ditransitive syntax. I think nine is a nice example. Sprek to manum, which is exactly like in eight, sprek to Israel barnum. But then we go on with an hem said. And them recounted many wonders. Now that is a doc construction. It's not to him said or said to him many wonders. It's and him said, uh, where uh, him is a dative. Again, the word order is unfamiliar for modern English, uh, but this is a standard way of doing things in, in old English. So the verb to cause motion, such as bear and bring, appear more frequently with a two prepositional phrase 
than in the ditransitive form, though they can occur there. The point of this slide is that some verbs, other than give verbs, are attested with the two prepositional phrase, uh, sometimes in variation. And they were coexisting with the give construction, which was mainly used in doc. So to summarize, give is used with a ditransitive syntax in Old English. Constructions of verbs of speaking and cause motion are mainly used with a prepositional phrase adjuncts and verbs of speaking, as I just showed. Uh, give sporadic evidence of potential alternation. During Middle English, several things changed. Speakers and writers extended the two prepositional phrase to transfer direct recipient verbs like give. So around the year 1225, we find and year to Joseph ha and gave to Joseph good fortune. Again, the word order is not modern word order, but the point here is that we have a direct recipient who is animate and occurs with two. That is, I believe, the first version, the uh, first example that anybody has found. And McFadden in 2002 interprets this new distribution as evidence that a 2PP had been reanalyzed from a goal adjunct to a recipient adjunct in the context of verbs of direct reception. And the result of that which was a change for one particular verb is that you get a vast amount of host class expansion over the Middle English period and widespread functional overlap of ditransitives and transitive prepositional expressions with the same verbs like say. And by hypothesis, the dative alternation construct team was constructionalized during Middle English and crystallized by around 1500. It's a nice example of what I talked about earlier, that you have a lot of small little changes occurring pre-constructionally, pre-constructionalization it should be. They, uh, there's a cluster of several different enabling distributions that accumulate over time. Uh, one of them is the analogization of the direct recipient verbs to verbs of communication. Another is use of two to mark recipient as well as goal in early Middle English. Another is the decline of ditransitive subtypes in general. I haven't shown that, but uh, given that there's a huge number of ditransitive subtypes of, mis of creation and miscreation, uh, possession and dispossession, and we know that they have disappeared, it's not surprising that they started disappearing uh, through the Middle English period. And, and this is really important too, there was a systemic typological shift to analyticity uh, during the Middle English period. By that is meant that the inflectional system broke down and was replaced by prepositions. So instead of uh, cat's tail, the cat's tail is as possessive, you get the tail of the cat. Uh, instead of give man in the dative, which you saw an example of earlier on, uh, on them go to men, 
uh, you get to a good map. Uh, that is what is known as analyticity. Uh, the same thing was happening in the verb system. Uh, you start to get past tense and uh, aspectual and modal verbs in addition to and finally instead of the inflections. So have gone instead of went and so forth. Now, uh, if you uh, read a traditional history of English, you will probably read that English has continued to become more analytic over time. And if that were true, one would think that the Tupac would have expanded. But Volk et al. show that in Archer, which is a continuation of the Helsinki corpus uh, up to uh, the year, I think, 1970, Volk uh, et al. show that in this Archer corpus, at least from 1650 on, later modern, early modern English on, the token frequency of Tupac steadily decreased. That's a big surprise to anybody who thinks that English is becoming more analytic. Uh, Volk could also that is consistently about 35%. The Dutch Institute. That is a post-constructionalization change, of course. Now, a lot of people have talked about various lexical idiosyncrasies that have developed. Gries and Stepanovich in 2004 talk about subclasses of diatransitives. Uh, oh, Coleman and de Klerk, uh, talked about subclasses of ditransitives that ceased to be used in the 18th century, uh, such as whisper and words of banishment. I don't think they fully realized at the time that this was not at all surprising. <laughs> uh, it's been happening for a good thousand years. Uh, and some, uh, Grisin Stefanovic said that some verbs are preferred in dark, like cost, tell, and allow and others in two park, like present, extend, and take. And as I mentioned, explain is now used in two park. The question is, how do we learn that explain me this is not idiomatic in modern English? Her 2010 book is interested in showing that in acquisition, uh, there's very little model in the input. Most adults don't use explain me this in modern English. So the child eventually learns that explain me this is kind of odd because there is no model in the input. But of course, that doesn't explain the historical <laughs> phenomenon. Why do people stop using diatransitives? I have no answer to that, and, but I'm sure uh, you are wondering about it. Uh, it seems to be simply a, a matter of almost ad hoc choices uh, that then become conventionalized. Uh, Coleman and de Klerk noticed that whisper type verbs, it's a manner of speaking type verbs, simply disappear uh, from the corpus in the uh, 18th century. Uh, why? They have no idea and I have none either. It, it's sort of fascinating why things disappear. I think there was a question in the, um, uh, in the forum about why things disappear, I really don't know. I mean, it has to do with uh, what people choose for cultural or other reasons uh, to replicate or not. So 
So going back to the theme of surprise that we find in the data alternations. In general, direct recipient constructions show a tendency to be used now in more synthetic syntax than they were in the 16th century. Now that is not unique. Smirksanya shows the shift away from analyticity is not only a matter of POC. Uh, there is decline also from the 17th century on with possessives and S. So we have the leg of the horse and the horse's leg. And the horse's leg, I had used the cat's leg before, but it doesn't matter because this is the possessive construction. The S possessive has become more frequent from the 17th century on than it was in early modern English. So we have two things that uh, Smoksani has pointed to, where the analyticity index rose from the 12th to the 16th centuries and declined from the 17th century onwards. Now I'm going to uh, turn to the benefactor. That was the, that was the data. Data of alternation arose by the end of Middle English uh, from the 17th century on, uh, we find increase in the, uh, in the synthetic use, which is the dark version and the two data alternation. So now I'm turning to the benefactor, which you will find is not exactly the same. Uh, when you look at Old English and Middle English texts, you will find that in keeping with earlier Germanic, there are a lot of expressions with dark syntax and varying degrees of benefactive and malefactive, so negative semantics. There were four classes. There was a malefactive dispossession construction, which I mentioned, transfer away from, to cut and shorten. The devil him shorteth his days. That devil, him shortens his days. We don't say that anymore. You say, the devil short, shortens his days. There's no him in there. So they're now used with two, not three, argument structures. Then there are, in Middle English, complex benefactives, like do someone a favor, make someone amends, or homage, or satisfaction. Those terms are mostly borrowed from French, and they now appear chiefly in fixed doc constructions, like people should do an old wish. Men should do an old wish don favor. Men should an old person do goodwill. You can do that in modern English, but it's not very good. It's okay. Thank you. I'm going on. <laughs> going on to the third one. Substitutive instead of benefactors. Uh, there are some verbs that are used uh, in dark in earlier English that can be understood as substitutive. Do X instead of Y. So you hold something instead of somebody else. You open somebody something uh, for them uh, instead of them. So if I open the door for you, uh, I'm doing it instead of you. They survived into the late 18th century. They're still found in dialects. They entail an intended benefit, but there's not literal rece intended reception. I call them on and declare son cite several substitutive benefactors, which they call pure benefactors in the 18th century. So you have examples like 13, the young Benedictine, 
holding him the torches he wrote on the assumption that in those days when there was no electricity, you had to hold a torch to be able to see in order to write. So the young Benedictine held the torch instead of him, for him. And let's see. These three types of ditransitives obsolesced or were restricted by mod the modern English period. Uh, those are all constructional changes. There was either complete obsolescence, the malefactors uh, simply don't occur at all in ditransitive constructions anymore. It is a new syntax. Some of them are restricted. This is the case of the complex benefactors in fixed expressions like do someone a favor. That's an example of niching. And there's partial obsolescence, substitutive uses like hold me the door, which is maintained in dialects and there's a regional kind of niching. But there is one set that has continued from Old English till now. And uh, it's called simple benefactors. This fourth class entails intended reception. It survived and is token, token very productive. You have creation and preparation like bake, build, cook, and make. And you have obtaining like buy, catch, get, and find. But it is not type productive in present day English. So if you get a new verb, it's not normally going to be used as a duck kind of benefactor. Facts is a relative new invention. It's a noun, but it's converted into a verb in English, so I faxed him, a copy is fine. But there's no way that that means I faxed it for him. It only means I faxed it to him. The direct recipient construction, the date of alternation, is very robust. You can not only find token productivity, but also type productivity. That means the construction get, can get more and more verb types that are licensed by the date of alternation. So the benefactive, which used to be a large schema with several ditransitive subtypes, has become extremely narrowed, extremely constrained. Most of the ditransitives, the benefactors have disappeared. They're not used anymore. All you get is the POC construction. Now, I was interested uh, to find that in Middle English, and this is Eva Zehentner's uh, work, Eva Zehentner found that uh, in Middle English, the Tupac was very productive, very stable for the, what are now the dative alternation verbs. But the prepositional phrase associated with benefactives was quite unstable in Middle English. So you can find build him them a synagogue and build a noble house to himself. That looks like the uh, data of alternation, because it has two in it. But you have other ones, other Prepositional phrases. Next, please. 
you find on the us shapes or colons of bliss and that God immend that God have to in shopping on say the good memory that God has shaped or created on you. So you find benefactors with two prepositional phrase. They're not very frequent, but you do find them with two prepositional phrase and with the on prepositional phrase. But four became more frequent and is more widely attested from late Middle English on. So you began to find around the end of the 14th and the 15th century, you begin to find that four becomes more frequently frequent. The miller in his own chamber, hem made a bed, that's the dock. The Sabbath is made for a man and not a man for the Sabbath. There you have the four benefactor. But clearly you have alternation in uh, around the end of the 14th century. And by the end of the 16th century, four had become to be prepared, preferred for benefactors with PP adjunct, so for the POC version. That is it consistent with increased analyticity. Uh, it appears that the purpose of four had been reanalyzed as a recipient marker in the context of simple benefactor verbs with animate recipients. And that is parallel to the neo-analysis of a two goal as a recipient marker in the case of the data alternation. So again, we find an assembly of small constructional changes enabling the rise of functionally similar constructions with functional overlap. And here, at the end of the 16th, beginning of the 17th century, the similarity between the data alternation and the benefactive alternation diverges. From about 1650, uh, you find a simple benefactive alternation more and more frequently. And EBO, the only English books online, uh, 50% of the four pocks have a theme collocating with a pass or passive participle. Uh, what's interesting about that is that it's often noted that when you have a change, there will be a constraint on where it arises. It's a particular context in which it is preferred. And so 17A, I had just built him a pretty apartment against his wedding day, but alas, he is wedded to his grave. So he never got that apartment. Someone intended him to get it, but he didn't. That was my example of the uh, unfulfilled intention. Well, the hypocrite Dunstan had built a little cell for himself. So you get the uh, alternation. And the laboratory was built for him in the Corinthian port. Now, you may recall that uh, at the beginning, I said that uh, Nisbet and Kay said that benefactors were, had adjuncts and they were not proper ditransitive because the recipient is not uh, a subject in the passives. Uh, they were talking about modern English. Uh, I have not been able to find any recipients that are subjects in the history of, of this construction. So nothing changed there. Uh, 
We can assume that by 1650, the benefactor of alternation had constructionalized as a constructing very, very similar to the date of alternation. So you have a indirect recipient constructing for the verb, question mark, uh, theme MP, question mark, indirect recipient NP, PP, just like uh, in the case of the recipient ditransitive constructing, where the question marks indicate unspecified position. And this indirect recipient ditransitive constructing has two variants, one a dock and one a four park, uh, which are horizontally connected. And there's a connection, not to cause motion this time, but to purpose. That's what four is about. Four is a purpose of, or was originally a purpose of, for this construction. And of course it still is in modern English. So there's some overlap here around 1650, form and function. But as I said, it's going to divert quite considerably. So some people have stressed the importance of analogy in change. And analogy is very important. But if analogy was quite as important as several people like the Smet et al. in 2018 claim, then one would expect that post-constructionalization, the data from the benefactor would begin to behave alike. And the benefactor would probably be analogized to the data of alternation, but it isn't. And a regression analysis of ICEGB, that's the uh, International Cor Corpus of English for Great Britain, Tyson et al. 2010 found 30% dark and 70% four park with benefactors. And these numbers are supported by work that I did with Eva Zehentner using EEBO. They are the reverse of what Bulk et al. found for present day English data of alternation. Uh, I put them there so you can see but they really are the reverse. So for data of alternation, you get 65% dark, 35% Tupac, which is almost exactly the opposite of 30% dark and 70% for Pac, the benefactors. So once the benefactor of alternation arose, somewhere around the 1650s, speakers and writers didn't analogize it to the token frequency of the direct construction, direct recipient construction, or the productivity of the direct recipient construction, or the shift back to synthetic word order that you find in the direct recipient construction. So this little table has a bit of redundancy, but that's there on purpose, because whichever way you think about it, you end up with a direct recipient, 65% in dark. That is synthetic syntax. That is a move away from analytic syntax. The recipient is given And it is not focus. Sorry, we can we come back it. The indirect recipient, the benefactor, however, is 30% dark, as, in, as I said, 70% pop. That is analytic syntax, it's not synthetic syntax. The recipient doesn't necessarily have to be given, and the recipient is mainly in focus. 
plus and minus are not 100%, they are preferences. Plus is preferred, minus is dispreferred. That's very important. And I think the history of the alternations is interesting because they show consistency with the general loss of the dark subschemas, which as I pointed out has been happening ever since early Germanic. As Coleman de Klerk show by the 18th century, the benefactor of dark subschemas had lost the malefactor, lost the substitutive open which was reassigned to Polk. And this loss of manner of speaking and banishment, they were reassigned to Polk. So there's general consistency with the loss of Doc throughout the history of English. And the benefactors show increasing analyticity, and that is inconsistent with the direct recipient constructions. And I conclude from that that differentiation plays a considerably more significant role than a strong hypothesis of analogization and attraction would suggest. Of course, for any analogization, there is always. Uh, some kind of dissimulation. But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the fact that in different constructions, there may be different degrees of analysisation and different degrees of non-attraction. Dissimulation. So while it's likely that the transitive plus purposive uh, adjunct expressions were partially analogized to the ditransitive direct recipient construction, given that there were three MPs, and although the benefactors could be used with an adjunct to MP in the Middle English, Speakers and writers apparently resisted total attraction to the direct recipient subschema. They differentiated it by selecting four as the preposition in POC. As I showed, there were various prepositions that were available in late Middle English uh, in the POC for benefactors. And they differentiated it by not countering the shift to analyticity. Now, by way of conclusion, the development of the dative and benefactive alternations illustrates an account of morphous syntactic change that clearly would have not be the subject of grammaticalization work. In fact, it couldn't be, there's, there's no loss of, uh, of morphology. There is, of course, loss of the constructions, but that's not something that uh, grammaticalization research has focused on. It illustrates extensive reorganization and loss at the schematic level. And it supports the idea that pre-constructionalization Conceptual changes involve a small step, small step shifts in use and assemblies. And post constructionalization, constructional changes involve changes in productivity of both types and tokens and in the composition of schemas. So I think this uh, example of the uh, date of alternation and benefactive alternation. Uh, is quite rich in showing not only how alternations work, but how reorganizations work, and how what I was talking about earlier in discussing the difference between constructionalization and uh, grammaticalization, 
there are clusters of changes before constructionalization, which are different in kind from the clusters of change that occur after constructionalization. So this in some sense illustrates most of the things uh, that I was discussing earlier in the uh, talk about constructionalization and grammaticalization. Uh, they not only complement each other, but they're also different in the range of data that, that they use. So these two types of alternation that I have discussed today show that both differentiation and attraction and analogization are keys to change. And I think they also show a domain in which constructional variation, the form, and the polysemy, the meaning, can be productively explored. So next time, I'm going to be talking about something rather different. I'm going to be talking about subjectification and intersubjectification and how they relate to constructionalization. They are not instances of constructionalization, nor are they instances of grammaticalization. But they are deeply intertwined with the development of certain expressions, such as elocutionary use of speech act verbs, expressives like, oh, by the way, uh, deictic tense, such as uh, the be going to feature that in the 18th century came to uh, express didactic tense uh, and discourse structuring markers. So thank you, and I look forward to questions, comments, challenges. And as I said at the beginning, thanks very much to Professor Oliveira. Uh, I think we won't have a disaster. <laughs> and so I will come back in a couple of minutes uh, and hope to have some questions, challenges, and general discussion. Thank you.
Okay, the first question here. How can a variational treatment be carried out without impacting the idea of a symbolic pairing of form and meaning? That is an excellent question. And basically it can be, in my thinking, uh, it can be carried out because of that model that I used uh, from Croft 2001 uh, at the beginning and that I find very, very helpful. Uh, construction is a unit as a form meaning pairing. That is true. But if we think that that's the only thing that it is, we can't talk about change at all. Nor can we talk about acquisition, nor can we talk about uh, dialect differences. There has to be some way of thinking about a construction not only as a form, form meaning pairing, which is a unit, but as a unit which has subparts. And uh, my way of uh, recalling without being able to show it online, uh, Croft's model is a unit, which is a construction, which has two parts to it. One is form, one is meaning. Form has three sub components or features, if you like. Syntax, morphology, phonology. All of those can change. And it has a meaning component. And again, the three, a semantics, pragmatics, discourse function. And those are combined by a symbolic link. So the variation uh, that I've been talking about today is mainly in the form dimension, keeping the meaning dimension re relatively uh, constant. Uh, now clearly there's informational information structure difference uh, that Bresson and Ford and others have shown uh, that has to do with givenness and newness, the focus, topic, topic focus, uh, point that Bresnan and Ford made in 2007. So the meaning isn't identical, but it's relatively similar. It's the form that differs here. And I think most people who've dealt with, who have read anyway, uh, who, who've dealt with variation have dealt with form variation, certainly the example that I gave today was a form variation. So if you think of the Croft model and you take the syntax and you say, okay, we have syntax at one stage is a ditransitive syntax and at another stage it uh, allows variation with the uh, prepositional uh, syntax. That basically is the answer, I think has to be, uh, it's not just a form meaning pairing and a form meaning unit. It is a very complex unit. I think the problem that uh, has arisen, and uh, this is uh, very present in the uh, introduction to the Zomerus-Vernova volume, uh, uh, about nodes and networks. And that's the, the volume in which Sehentner's in my paper uh, appears on the benefactives and ditransitives. Uh, the problem is that people have related the four meaning pairing as a sign to Saussure's notion of a sign, which is a fixed, unit that simply cannot apply in a world of construction grammar.
Yeah, Von, von der Walde uh, mainly talks about synchronic horizontal links. And uh, only briefly accounts for historical ones. But as is the case uh, in, in most of our work, as historical linguists, we can take synchronic ideas and see whether they work uh, diachronically. And uh, Zehentner did the work with the diatransitives, uh, data alternations, and uh, a lot of the work on the benefactives. I was particularly interested in the benefactives. And uh, I, I hope we've shown that, yes, one, one can use so-called degenerative relations that uh, historically, that at one time certain things uh, belong to the same family, belong to the same schema, and uh, had variants, and this, of course, can change over time. Do we know whether there's a difference in dialect and text type? There's definitely a difference in dialect that uh, Coleman and de Klerk uh, mentioned very briefly in the 2011 article. Uh, if you uh, look at work on diatransitives and blocking on the knee, there's a woman who wrote a book on uh, diatransitives in, in dialects, and yes, absolutely, she shows uh, basically uh, synchronically uh, that there are enormous dialect differences. Um, and not only dialect differences in terms of the kinds of examples I, I use, but ones that are supposed to be absolutely impossible in, in standard English, like I gave him it, or I gave it him. There's a lot of dialect differences in the use of it. Um, it's not something that I'm extremely familiar with, but yes, uh, there's definitely variation between Doc and Park uh, in dialect. And in text type, uh, uh, I suspect there is difference. Uh, I think that in reports, and in very formal English, you're more likely to get the analytic form. But that's a guess. I, 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 I'm not familiar with that work, but I, I, I'm sure there are both dialect and text type differences. Oh, OK. Well, thank you for those questions. And uh, as I say, next time we will talk about subjectification and intersubjectification. And happy Easter, meanwhile.